your audience will be more likely to pay attention if your ad doesn't immediately look and feel like an ad. People consider me like a performance marketer, not a brand marketer. I would deep down in my core, I'm a brand marketer. Like, it matters to me what people think about a brand. In order for people to buy, you have to get their attention. My goal is to get that attention get, and to not be distracted or led astray by needing to make things pretty for my ego. You're seeing more and more Audi content in the organic feed. You're seeing more and more advertisers follow this trend. When does that change? I have no reason to believe that content is going to get less ugly anytime soon. Traditional brand people would tell you you're an idiot. <laughs> for not featuring the brand as quick as possible. But like our goal is to get people to pay attention more to get them to the heart and the meat of the ad rather than just like get that impression of like, this is the brand. People who say CPCs matter regarding Facebook ads are a bunch of Ding dongs. The hilarious thing is like a lot of marketers have just been trained to make stuff for warm audiences. It's just unnecessary. Great ads will work for both of those audiences. Anyone can make an ad. Shoot on your phone, yep. edit in CapCut. No more excuses, just make ads. Make the longest ad that you can that doesn't require any edits. If that's six seconds, okay. If that's 15 seconds, great. If that's 30, cool. If that's three minutes, amazing. Just shoot something. Today is a very special day for me because I get the privilege of sitting down with my Marks and Idol. Wow. Um, Barry, thank you for coming on the channel. I'm going to cry. Um, I'm going to start I'm gonna right off the top. We're going to make me super, cry. Super, super emotional. Um, <laughs> okay. Barry is my Marks and Idol because um, when I had zero followers on Twitter, you're yeah. the one who retweeted me. Yeah. And got was my a big first fan. 15 I was a, followers. I was an early fan of yours. You said some smart stuff. I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Yeah. I don't know where that came from. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> so today, what we're going to do is we are going to pick Barry's brain. We're going to look through some of his best tweets, and I'm going to ask him to explain them. I'm not just your idol, by the way. I'm your business partner now. That's true. Yeah. That's also very true. Uh, so, Barry, let's dig into some of your tweets and see what we have to say about them. Let's do it. I love my tweets. If you're coming up with new ad ideas, assume nobody, number one, mm -hmm. knows or cares about your brand. Yeah. Number two, has time for your content. Yeah. Number three, cares what you have to say unless it relates to them clearly and instantly. Did that tweet do well? Did that have more than 100 likes? Yes. Oh, nice. I really like that tweet. Um, and we kind of talked about this in another video, but like even if you're making stuff that will be seen by your, your audience, even if you're making stuff that like might be seen by your audience, it's best to just make content that is relevant to people for other reasons than your brand and your product. You wanna make stuff that is more broadly relevant to a lot of people and just like, because you don't know. Like if you're thinking about like putting a TV ad out there, that's how I look at a lot of this now because we've lost kind of control of targeting and the systems automate to targeting now. I kind of like rather put an ad out there that will make sense to more people and will work for people who don't already know or care what, I, what I'm what i selling them. And they have to see so many ads in a given day. Like there, people see like thousands of ads in a day, like, like they don't care. So you gotta make it matter to them because they don't care about your brand colors, your fonts, your like what your brand's mission is yet, unless they already know what it's worth to them. So like, you got to make it in, you know, before someone can care about your brand, they care about themselves. So just go focus on, on that person who just cares about themselves. Make it, make it valuable and relevant to them, not relevant to your brand. Um, the way that I like to think of it is almost like, you know, you have to, like, especially when talking to cold audiences, like you have to own the right yeah. to tell them about your brand. Yeah, you really like do. Almost like use that, like use that first touch point mm -hmm. as like an on-ramp. And then yeah. once they start like engaging yourself, maybe they go to the site, right. maybe they you, know, you get them into one of your or into one of your flows. Like yeah. now you've got, like now you've earned the right to start speaking to them a little bit more, yeah. like a little bit more about what your your brand mission is and, 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 and what you stand for. But like on a cold ad where someone doesn't know, care about you, and they're just looking like, cause as we as we all know, like no one's on <laughs> their feed to look at, uh, <clears throat> to look at ads. They yeah. wanna look at memes. They yeah. wanna look at like funny stuff. They wanna look at friends, family. Um, they don't want to look at ads right. and you've got such precious real estate and you really just, you cannot waste anything there in, with anything other than giving them a reason to continue watching the ad and then hopefully click through to landing page. And, and the important thing is like, if someone's listening to that and being like, well, yo, what about retargeting ads? And what about ads that, you know, I want to make for my, my warmer audiences? Cause you said cold audiences and prospecting, whatever. But like in reality, think about it again as TV. Like 
if you can make an ad that's relevant to a person and, you know, even if it's not in the first second immediately hitting on the brand and the product and the, the, the value props, like if it's still relevant in the problem, in the hook, in whatever, in the main piece of content, mm. then that piece of content is still going to be relevant to them the second, third, fourth, fifth time when they view it, right? If it's about something relevant to that person, not just relevant to the brand or the product, then that person is more likely to consume that ad repeatedly rather than if it's just about the product, then they're probably going to be like, yeah, 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 I get it. Like, whatever. I don't, I don't need this anymore. It's not, it's not relevant to me. So really, especially if you, it works both for prospecting cold stuff and warm stuff. The hilarious thing is like a lot of marketers have just been trained to make stuff for warm audiences and be, and, and it's just unnecessary. You don't really actually need to necessarily do that. You don't need to tailor that. If you make great ads, great ads will work for both of those audiences. Mm -hmm. And you just include, you just make basically what I call a full funnel ad, you know, something that is relevant to gold audiences first. And then as you keep watching the ad, it gets through the funnel to consideration and to actually taking action. So you look at the actual like funnel. And that, that, by the way, that was another one of the tweets that I pulled up. Uh, <laughs> let's, full let's, shift to that. let's go to that. Um, yeah, so you're thinking about that that the whole stage of the yeah. customer process throughout the ad and how you're telling that story. Yeah, it's especially with Facebook ads, it's possible because the game is you can make a video ad. Like you can make a video ad and what I love to say, and this might be another tweet, uh, and this is something I stole from someone else, which is there's no such thing as a video that's too long or an ad that's too long, yeah. just one that's too boring. So like if you can keep people engaged and consuming – your, your video as it keeps going and through that cycle, then yeah, you can make a really full funnel ad of getting people's relevant attention with a relevant problem and then moving them through about the solution, moving them through about like why you need this, the value props and and then selling. Like you can literally do that all in one ad. You don't have to, yeah. but you you because you can, like if you haven't tried that, you you should try that and you should look at ways to do that. There's more low quality content produced and consumed now than ever before. Yeah. That's why there's a need for ugly ads and UGC overall. Yeah, I like talking about this while we're in a podcast studio. I think that's very funny to me. <laughs> yeah, it's nice juxtaposition. <laughs> I wish this was us over uh, FaceTime. On that sofa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, yeah. yeah. But no, like uh, just like us on a like Google Meet, <laughs> yeah. you know, like yeah. or a Slack call, whatever. Um, but yeah, like just, you know, if you think about we all have phones, at least one, I'm, I'm carrying two right now that are capable of shooting content for that I can shoot for free, right? I have tons of space on my phone to shoot content. Most people do. So like the limitations to shooting content are so small right now. It's just, it's just over the last, you know, five, 10, 20 years, it's just got, just gotten so much easier and easier and easier for content to be made and shot. So like anyone can shoot anything for any reason at any time, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And because of that, more content can also be shared. It's also easier to share that content easier than ever before. So now what you see is just people consuming all sorts of content for anything. It, it, there's no cost. Like it used to be expensive to, to shoot on film. It used to be expensive to buy memory cards and storage that you could film and take photos and videos of things. And now it, we all just have it on the device that we all have in our pockets that we can all shoot all the time. And again, we have networks, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, where we can just share it. So that prol proliferation of that kind of content that is just everywhere and is being consumed widely is, is largely why we want to make ugly ads, or I suggest making ugly ads, is because that content is being shot on a phone and that content is being consumed on a phone. Mm -hmm. So people are used to seeing content that looks like that. Whereas TV, you're watching, for the most part, TV is polished. Like the stuff you're seeing on TV is shot on fancy cameras. Mm -hmm. It's edited. It's got, you know, good music. It's got thought. It's really thoughtful lighting and choices and decisions. So it makes sense for commercials on TV to look and feel that way. But with content on your phone, on Instagram, like you're not on Instagram to see a fully polished ad in your feed. Like most people aren't, aren't looking for that. It's just like not what they expect to see. So yeah, that's the whole basis, base premise of like make ugly ads. Am I wearing my make ugly ads? Hell yeah. Uh, I wasn't Hell sure yeah. if it was something else. Make ugly ads, yeah. Um, when does that change? Because everyone's like, you're seeing more and more ugly content in the organic feed. Yeah. 
you're seeing more and more advertisers yeah. follow this trend. Right. What do you think is like the like the barometer? Um, it, it uh, is it going to be like no matter how many advertisers are making it, if if on the organic feed everyone yeah. still does things ugly, advertisers going to do things ugly, or do you think that as more advertisers start to do this, yeah. it becomes slightly less effective? I think it's going to be a race to the bottom, and I think that there's just going to be it's more it's not necessarily a race to the bottom in terms of things getting uglier and uglier mm. but i think there's going to be continual tactics by you know native organic content creators that people are going to they're they're going to keep doing to make stuff that telegraphs that it's not an ad or it's not like sponsored content or it's not like produce it's like for it's supposed to look and feel like it's for us. Mm. So like if you can catch those trends and and pay attention to what's happening organically and what your audience is into and what your audience is consuming natively, mm. not ads, but like what organic content they're consuming and find those trends and shoot in those styles, that's what really matters. But I I have no reason to believe that content is going to get less ugly anytime soon. It's unless it, you know, just becomes easier for people to just open their camera and shoot prettier stuff. So as, you know, phone cameras get better, things might get prettier, but you know, there's always, there's always going to be, it, that's the the trend is just going to be like, what is the easiest, quickest thing for creators to shoot and edit and like put out. And like that, that's what the, that's what basically your ads should look like. Yeah. How do you think AI content changes that? I have no idea. I really, I'm really, you know, concerned about it in some ways because I'm, what I'm really eager to see is how much AI-generated content we'll be consuming, mm. right, as consumers, how much of it will be consumed. And I'm then interested in seeing also, like, how good I can make, and this will change over time, how good I can make ads using AI to look like they're not AI generated. So that's yeah. another barrier. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. Like also, what is the definition of an AI generated ad? Is it like AI scripted and story, you know, storyboarded and planned? And then they the AI takes all the existing clips that I have and just jams them together and does it for me of real clips. Like that's AI generated in, in a lot of ways. Um, my theory is that people crave authenticity. Yeah, and it will be interesting to see where AI starts to make things that fulfill that. But I also will be excited to see what humans do. Man, this is heady. What humans will do to make things look and feel more authentic? I mean, there's just so many questions that opens up. Like, yeah, so many questions. Yeah. Um, there's a like. I'm also trying to work out like, is AI going to be able to create authenticity in the same way that a human is? There is a, eventually a very, it should be in, able to in theory, but there is a like a very real scenario at least at the beginning where like people's flood people's like content fees just get flooded with AI content, and then the pendulum swings and like things get even more authentic and even uglier until AI gets to a point where it can then replicate yeah. the ugliness of what humans can do and then at that point like yeah. how do people feel about advertising in general like when yeah. when half of the things on your feed is ai yeah do you care do you do you trust advertising at all right. and then or, or do you even care like if the problem solving and the storytelling is good enough do you care if you're being told this is a great product that solves your problems yeah. by a human or by a not a human well what's interesting to me is like i'm i don't think we we're very far from a period where like viral videos of things happening like things you would like, like bloopers, right? Think think about like bloopers. Like think about like America's Funniest Home Videos, right? Like that's a that type of content is like very popular, gets yeah. a lot of views. Mm -hmm. Like we are not far away from AI generated bloopers. Just yeah. like you know things going awry, being generated in AI that look real. Yeah, and like you know, or like things looking like they're shot in a doorbell camera. <laughs> You know, of like yeah. of like a mailman getting chased by a dog or something like that. Like that stuff, we're really not far from mm -hmm. that being AI generated. So like, what will we be consuming? What will matter? And I, I, you know, what what and you know, AI will be generate able to generate better storytelling as well. 
than than a lot of humans. So it'll be it'll be really interesting to see where the trends go. Well, here's a scenario. Yeah, uh, I want to present to you. I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with this mm -hmm. stance, but I was having a conversation with someone that we both know the other day, and he's very bullish on um, uh, on the progression of AI and creative. Mm -hmm. What if, in theory, like you know, we work on accounts where we've got clients who have tens of hours of content yeah. uploaded into Meta. Meta's yeah. got that content. What's stopping in 12 months time, mm -hmm. in 24 months mm -hmm. time, 36 months time, whenever it is, Meta just going, look, I've got a lot of content yeah. from you. Yes. I can either take that content mm -hmm. and mash it up or I can use some kind of yeah. AI technology to create more content yes. similar to what you've given me. Yeah. And I can take that and I can serve one-to-one -one mm -hmm. custom ads mm -hmm. to every user. Cause I know that Barry converts off of a yeah. five reasons why. Yeah. And Alex converts off of a testimony, like yep. a single testimonial. Yeah, we're like, you can also like take the same piece of content and, and effectively like change the appearance of the person in it. We've talked about yeah. changing my voice in, in or changing the voice of an in an ad or of a voiceover to be, you know, you you're literally using like TikTok voice changer or excuse me, CapCut's voice changer to just change the sound of a voice. So like, it's the same thing. Like it can be taking the same concept, but just making it visually or audio wise more relevant to the the consumer. I agree. Right. Is it, yeah. And, and just like, I know so like we've, we've spoken internally about some uh, testing we're doing with some, some like AI video platforms and just the, progression of those from mm -hmm. like five or six months ago, which basically they, they were non-existent five yeah. or six months ago to, to where they are today, mm -hmm. makes me think like, okay, things that we think might be two, five, 10 years away. Like if you told me that, you know, the, some of the, like the open AI Sora stuff, yeah, yeah. like if you told us six months ago, like that was, you'd be able to literally type in a prompt and you'd be able to get video, yeah, yeah. like a video generated of that. You say you're crazy. Like it's still two, three years away. Yeah. So all of that to say, like a lot of these developments, there's a very realistic scenario in which yeah. they happen quicker than we think they'll happen. Yeah. But we also don't know. They might not. Well, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see where expertise, human inter you know, expertise will be needed. Like I do what you said about like Facebook, you know, meta having a way to do that, like that. I think that is inevitable. Um, and I think it will help a lot of brands, especially brands that like don't have our expertise, don't have our editors, don't have whatever. I think it'll help them go, you know, uh, lift their game. I think it'll raise the floor, mm -hmm. but it won't raise the ceiling. I think, it, you know, like that's where our, our jobs will still be for, I assume for a while is, you know, looking at how we can work with AI to improve stuff. And I think, you know, we still need to be using, like, it'll be interesting to see where, you know, we start to lose out in terms of psychology and empathy to the, the systems. That will be terrifying. Yeah. And interesting. But also fascinating. I find it fascinating. Yeah, well, until we lose our jobs. Yeah. I still find it fascinating. That's true. Point. Serious. <laughs> okay. Let's stay on the ugly ads topic. Mm -hmm. When most marketers hear about ugly ads, mm. they clutch their pearls and <laughs> assume, oh, those are only for sales but at the expense of brand. Right. The thought of doing something less than 100% polished doesn't make sense for many marketers. I'm not saying make the ugliest, ad, ugliest ad possible. Right. I'm saying you should study the content your audience consumes and try to emulate that. Yeah. Your audience will be more likely to pay attention if your ad doesn't immediately look and feel like an ad. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that is everything. We've already talked about this a little bit, but like, I'm a, you know, people consider me like a performance marketer, not a brand marketer. I, I, I'm a deep down in my core, I'm a brand marketer. Like it matters to me what people think about a brand. And, uh, in order for people to buy, you have to get their attention in order to people get people to change their mind about the brand, to get people to care about the brand, change their act, their intent about a brand is to get them to pay attention with the relevant attention. So my goal is to get that attention, get that relevant attention and to not be distracted or led astray by making, needing to make things pretty for my ego. Um, anyone, any brand can shoot something uglier in a more native, more authentic, more believable way um, that fits on the platform better to just get pe past people's subconscious ad blockers. Like it's really, that is it. That's the bar. And if, you people, if people won't watch your brand, your, excuse me, if people won't watch your ad, 
they're not going to care about your brand. And if your ad is only about your brand, people aren't going to watch it. So they're not going to learn to care about your brand. And the, the thing is like rotten gummy worms, right? Like I can't just say rotten gummy worms a million times or like show it just doing like, yeah, maybe like it would help brand wise to like show it with tons of cool people doing cool stuff with it a million times. And people will finally get like, Oh yeah, I'm cool. I want to try it. But like in reality now it's the opposite. Like you got to get people to try the product. Like that's one of the best things you can do because nobody wants to get behind a brand or a product that sucks and that doesn't make sense to them. It doesn't work for them and they can't use like, it's just not going to happen. So you got to get people to, you know, want to try your product, want to try your brand. And then from there, they'll become fans of your brand. There are just too many brands now. You know, you go back 30, 40, 100 years ago, whatever, there weren't as many brands of, you know, of anything. So, you know, you had to like, that That made sense. But now in 2024, there's like infinite brands about pretty much every product in every category and they're more coming up every day. So like, it's really hard to do and like, you know, someone might hear that and say, that's exactly why you need to focus more on your brand. And in some ways you might be right. But again, content wise, you need to step one, get attention. Like if you, if you fail to do that because you're too focused on hitting people with your brand immediately, then nobody's going to pay attention and nobody's going to care and you're not going to change any minds. Yeah. I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about treating it as like a, a, an on-ramp. Like yeah. you can speak about your brand, like absolutely. But like first you have to earn the right. Yeah. Own the right, right from 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 the cold audience to be able to speak about your brand, um, and once you've done that with some more like performance skewed ads, uh, mm -hmm. then by all means, once they're, once they're into your funnel, like by all means, yeah. What would you say to someone who's who's watching this and mm -hmm. like they may be in line with your philosophy and they want to do something uglier, but they have people above them or like who are making the decisions yeah. who are strict on guidelines? Just quit. Honestly, get out of there. Like you're it, not, you know. Maybe not really, but I do really do mean that. Go go work somewhere else that you're not going to be that uh, hand, you know, have your hands tied that much. But like share them, share them some examples, find some examples from other brands. It doesn't, shouldn't be a, an example from a brand in your category. It shouldn't be a competitor. Find other brands that are doing that stuff. You should be able to share examples and like juxtapose that versus what you're doing. I think it's easy enough to find brands doing ugly stuff these days. Mm -hmm. You can send them, you know, m m me, send them my content you know, get me on a consulting call with them, but, uh, I'm sure that's not going to happen, but it does. I am, I do get brought in for that pretty much reason a lot where yeah. it's like someone who's like, Hey, uh, I know we need to do this, but I'm don't feel comfortable sticking my neck out to say this. Can we hire you to come in and tell us what to do yeah. so that it's coming from you? And I'm like, yep, yeah, sure. You got it. Um, so if you need me to come do that for you, I'm happy to. If you want to pay Barry to shout at your team members, uh, it's my favorite thing to do is yeah. get paid to just shout at. I clients. actually tried to get him to shout at me more. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's my goal. I do need to shout at you more. Um, that's a good segue into the next tweet, which is actually a tweet from me, but I'm pretty sure that I got it from you. I, 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 <laughs> I'm excited for you to admit that because uh, I feel like you get a lot of your content. And there's, a, there's a couple of tweets that like I've just like felt like I just I thought they were mine. Yeah. And then I was researching your tweets last night, and then I just saw oh shit like Barry tweets out like yeah, six yeah, months yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. I do that to myself, by the way. Yeah. Where I've like tweeted out the the same thing, not realizing it. Or especially like Twitter polls. I do that a lot. Yeah, where like yeah you I've do put love out the same poll. poll. I do. Well, I try and, and it's, by the way, just fun fact, anytime I'm feeling like oh, I don't have inspo, I'm like, what's a question I can ask my audience and I'll put in a poll. And the polls get really big reach. Yeah. Surprisingly big reach. Um, especially if it's like relatable. Um, but I've asked like the same poll a bunch about like uh, either attribution or like uh, targeting audience, like existing uh, customers. Like I feel like I've pulled that like every quarter. Not realizing it. Anyway. You're just making sure that you hit like different pockets of your audience. Not really. I was <laughs> not even thinking about it. I'm just like, ah, I'm wonder I wonder what people think about this today. And I forget yeah. that people have already answered it. Yeah. But anyway, the tweet is you'll find way better ad inspiration on yeah. the organic feed than you will look at competitors. Yeah. And we've already touched on that. Like, go look at content that your audience is looking at. That's and the, or just go look at your content that is fed to you and find trends in it. What are the camera angles? What are the lighting techniques? What are the what are the ads sound like? Right? Uh, you know, we talked about. Uh, actually, I forgot to mention like using a tiny mic, yeah. right? Like we're holding a mic like this. Mm -hmm. Like we could have done the. the oh, sorry, oh, that's my phone. We could have done the whole interview talking like this, and it's mm -hmm. a whole different effect. Yeah, a clip from this feel looks and feels very different than it being 
planted here. Yeah. You know? But th- that's one side of it. But then the other side of it that like is also important is like why you shouldn't look at competitors. Well, if you're looking at your competitors, you know, you're just gonna create a sea of sameness. Like it's you know, I see so many times where competitors are looking at you, you're looking at competitors, and they're just like you're barely getting out of the cycle. So you're better off like looking at other brands and other spaces if you're going to look at brands at all. But even then, like I'd rather look at organic content styles to find stuff to emulate because it's you really should be making content and not ads. Yeah. This is the whole premise of ugly ads. And also that really? thing, one thing that we spoke about before as well is like make accounts. Make burner accounts. Oh, oh yeah. Uh as if you were your prospect and yeah. see what they get served. You mean you mean fate like a uh, Instagram profile. Yeah, like yeah. a like an Instagram profile or a TikTok mm-hmm. profile. Um or even just like just googling like, like consume the like news articles that they consume like go on the go on the Reddit forums, go on the core posts, uh read the news articles like really get in the head of the yeah. person that we are trying to speak to. Yeah. Um understand what they are consuming. Yeah. Like if it is a TikTok or an Instagram, um what's the pacing like? You know, what kind of creators are being yeah. used? Yes. Is it high production, low production? Yes. What does the lighting look like? Because right. that's how you're really gonna like blend in to stand out. Yeah. Uh, by creating something that is in line with what they expect yeah. from that particular problem yeah. or kind of demographic. Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely. Of course, just because it's done well on organic, it doesn't mean it necessarily will translate into paid. No, but definitely not. That's not an insignificant piece of information. Yeah. If something has gone and got like two million views, three yeah. million views, four million views on organic, like that tells me that whatever they've done, yeah. and that once again, there are so many variables that will affect like that level of success. Yeah. But like something is resonating with people that's yeah. getting their attention yeah. and keeping them yeah. watching. Yeah. And you got to look at all the, the things of it. It's not like it's the words they're using. It's the camera angle. It's the lighting. It's the pacing. It's the framing. It's so many things that may or may not be what's triggering or what's getting that right or wrong. So you just got to try and like find those trends like, oh, okay, this person did this this way and like said these words and this person did this this way and said these words and they use different camera angles, but it worked on both. So maybe it's what they said, or maybe it's how they're holding their little tiny microphone, or maybe it's, you know, um, that they're shot, you know, the camera up their, you know, up their nose instead of from up high. Cause a lot of people like, like to shoot from up here cause it makes them look skinnier, but, lot, but like maybe the more authentic way is to shoot from down here and mm. you can see the lighting in the background. Like, uh, the ceiling lighting in the background, like w- there's so many variables like that. And this, what uh, this all comes down to is having deep empathy for both your consumer and the creators of the content that your consumer is consuming. So like you really need to empathize with both of those things. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating. Clever ads. This is a recent one. Marketers love them. Mm-hmm. Consumers ignore them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I got a lot of comments on that one specifically. I, I don't a hundred percent co-sign this. Like not every tweet I, I say is like a hundred percent, you know, uh, but there's a definitely a lesson in there. I definitely know there is a lesson in there, right? Like the more marketers try to be clever, the more, uh, they're likely to just make something that people don't care about and it will just be ignored. There are definitely clever ads that have worked, but like, uh, clear is better than clever for ads yeah. and just in general communication, uh, clear over, over clever wins. So that's what I, I try and focus on. And that's, that's what I would recommend. Yeah. There's definitely a, like, uh, a, like a difficult situation that I see like brands and agencies fall into where like, you know, you've got things that like, maybe they, they've got a situation where they've got performers on the account, but they find it difficult to recreate or like find yeah. new top performing ads. So they try and branch out and they try yeah. to do something different. Now there's a very fine line b- between doing things that are different and like not trying to overcomplicate things and sure. be too clever. But it's like it's a really delicate balance to find. And we've started like we've we've talked about this a lot internally yeah. at AdCrate. Like we want to push the limits and do things that are like bigger creative swings. But like also with those bigger creative swings, we at the same time we need to make sure that we are doing the fundamentals, like we're solving problems and we're yeah. telling a story that communicates and the making problems. content and making content. Uh, because oftentimes when you do try and push the boat out, you try and do things that are a little more different. Yeah. You try and make things that are clever. And I mean, I can't tell you how many ads I've posted onto, onto like Twitter or LinkedIn. And mm-hmm. I've had a, a bunch of people in the comments like, this is incredible. Like it's an amazing ad. Yes. Da, da, da. And the ad account sucks. It's a different story. Yeah. Same. Like, and that's the thing is like, 
often we see like we, as marketers, advertisers, we look at an ad and we're like, oh, that's clever. Like, let's do that. We can, we can let's let's steal that. Like, that's like marketers looking at other marketers and awarding other marketers. So like, you know, the the ads that win con awards don't necessarily sell anything. They just, you know, made a pretty, you know, emotional maybe thing. And it doesn't mean it sold well or worked well better than something else would have. Um, so marketers, like, rewarding other marketers is just really not a good way to go about it. And that's what happens often is like, oh, brand so-and-so did this clever thing. We look at, like, Liquid Death. They did this clever thing, right? Like, but that's not really what most brands need to be doing or should be doing or would work well for them. And I, I don't even know if it works well for Liquid Death. Liquid, A big part of Liquid Death's brand is that they are clever and snarky and, you know, edgy, whatever. So, like, you know, but it's it's hard to say, like, what is actually going to to work. And clever is just not the best bet for most people listening to this. Yeah, and I'm trying to, like, in real time, train myself out of this because sometimes I see ads that we make and I go, oh, that's good. And, and like, it's not the if I think that or if other people, if other marketers think that, that means it should be a signal of a bad ad. But yeah. it's just, like, sometimes checking yourself and going, like, do I think this is good? Right because I think it's clever, yeah. or do I think this is an objectively good ad? Right, right, exactly. I've got like, this example that we made uh, a few months ago, mm -hmm. which um, got LinkedIn going. Uh, LinkedIn absolutely yeah, we loved it. We need to do it. that more, we need to do that more. Um, <laughs> uh, absolutely loved it. Um, it completely tanks inside the ad account. Yeah. I think you'll remember the ad that but I'm like, talking That's about. the thing, most, most ads I see people share like that they're really proud of, it's like, you know, like the ads that you'll bring in business for us for ad great are not the like That's sharing those are often not the ads that will perform best in the account. What really people want to see is like the ad that marketers want to see. Yeah. You know, so that this like features the brand really positively. This was a spin off. Like, this is one, one that features you. It's, it's a spin off of one of our top performers for mm. Oprah Pop, the popcorn brand. Oh. And we were so stoked when we made this ad. Which like, one was this? Um, this one. So I'm going to play it. I'll put, the, the, I'll put up the screen share. Um, this was something that we took from Overnight Oats, which are another like like liquid. Oh, yeah. Everyone loves everyone loves stealing from this Overnight Oats. Was a clever. We were we saw a clever ad and we made a we stole it a clever ad. Yeah. Correct. And it didn't perform at all at all. I'm about to try this new popcorn. My wife is making me try it blindfolded. I am so sick of seeing these ads. There is no way that this popcorn is that good. Okay, I just think it's funny that you can have such a strong opinion without even trying it. Okay, fair, but it's got to be overhyped. All you all talk about is how it's gourmet, the different flavor options, how easy it is to make, like... Yes, you are right about all those things. It is great, it is easy to make, it is gourmet, and all those amazing flavors are available, but also just, side note, you don't have to eat all the crazy flavors. Lightly salted is fire! All right, fine, I'll try it. All right. It's pretty good. Yeah. That's what I thought. If you're still watching this, click the ad now so you can try it for yourself. Opopop.com. There you go. Yeah. I mean, like, hard to know if it's the concept that failed or the execution. Uh, or both. We tried this on a few other brands. It didn't work either. Yeah. I mean, it also could be in the execution for all of them, right? Possibly. Possibly. Well, it performed on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Two marketers. Um, and that's the problem is... Marketers, you know, talking with marketers make ads that marketers will like. But which interestingly is a is a is a point to watch out for. Like just because you see something on social media, um, unless you know people are sharing metrics, which not many people will do, especially if it's a, like a unique style like right. this. Um, be wary and don't just say that because this person who's got a lot of followers or this person is sharing this ad that we need to go and recreate it because oftentimes it isn't actually making money. Yeah, I mean, I've I've shared some too that like you know, like I shared a post-it note ad that I like shot for Rotten that you know I, I was excited about and it did horrible. Okay, that was slightly different in that you were saying like I'm gonna launch yeah, this, yeah, yeah. Rather but than, still like, like the internet loved it, right? right? Yeah, and I loved it too. I did love it like it as well. Yeah, yeah, but it failed. People who say CPCs matter regarding Facebook ads are a bunch of ding dongs, misguided. Conventional marketers. I wish I, yeah, I probably had originally, I bet the original draft of that was ding dongs. There was another draft, I, there was another tweet that I didn't take. <laughs> the system optimizes your impressions and traffic 
for you to get the most possible conversions yeah. for your money, regardless of individual CPM, yeah. CPC, and conversion rate metrics. Not all impressions or clicks have the same value. Yeah, I mean, this is important deep ad theory. Like, this is the the space that I've grown to love and focus on, and where I think people lot here like hearing me talk about it a lot is like, you know, traditionally you learn like, okay, clicks, more clicks equal more sales. But like it's not really true when we use an optimized system. It's actually not really ever true. Um, it can relate, right? Fundamentally, if you're if you have ads that are getting people to click for the right reasons, and then they're buying more, then yeah, it, it adds up. But that's not always the case, um, especially an optimized system that can deliver on different platforms and placements and users that click differently for different reasons. So the ads that get the cheapest clicks are often not the best ones. Um, the ads that get the most expensive clicks are all, probably also not the worst, the best ones. But, um, you know, just trying to optimize for lower clicks in general or monitoring that, when you're optimizing your goal is sales, it's really not even a, it's not a good primary metric. It's not even really a good secondary metric to focus on. Um, it's a good diagnostic to try and understand how and why maybe people are clicking or not. Um, and what, what about the ad is working or not. But like, again, it's all, everything is about relevance. Everything mm -hmm. is about relevance. So like the people that are watching your ad, you don't know if they're watching for certain reasons or not. You don't know if people are clicking the ad thinking they're going to get one thing or the other, right? An ad can have a great CPC, but be for the kind of wrong reasons or for the wrong audience. If, if they're being slightly misled or if it feels like, if they're being sold a premium product in an ad, but then they get to the site and it's not that premium of a product, then you know there's a disconnect there, or same vice versa. Um, if they're expecting like a deal and it's a high price, like that click is irrelevant. So, you know, getting you want more relevant clicks, mm -hmm. and there's not really a good measure of that. So, um, yeah, just like CPC again is is a okay diagnostic, something to pay attention to in that way, but not really the right metric. And it makes sense why people want to look at it because of just so many reasons and legacy mindsets. But in an um, optimized system, it's just not that helpful. Excuse me. People sorry. watching who are thinking, okay, if we're not looking at CPCs, right. what am I looking at? You should be looking at your cost per purchase, really, or your you know cost per acquisition, or your ROAS, I guess. But really what you should be looking at is the amount of spend. You should be putting stuff into the platform and letting it optimize for those actions for you, mm -hmm. and then looking at what's being spent, what's getting the most spend. And that is a, is a better sign of like what's working and what's not than what actually has the highest cost or the lowest cost or the um, highest rows or the lowest rows. Like, because you're looking at data that's being optimized. It's already being optimized for you. Yeah. So like the system isn't trying to get you the lowest cost for every single ad, every single ad set. It's trying to get you the lowest cost for Every, all of the ads in that ad set or all of the ad sets in that campaign if you're using campaign budget optimization. So looking at one specific object does not really do a good job of telling you uh, which one is working well because of the breakdown effect. Yeah. If you don't know the breakdown effect, go Google Facebook ads breakdown effect and learn about how it, the ads, the data can be deceiving because it might look like Facebook spending a lot of money on an ad or an ad set that looks like it's not performing well. But in reality, that ads getting getting more budget is potentially taking away that uh, you spend from other ads that would be doing worse at a higher scale. Yeah. So and and also like the top spending ad or ad set, whatever, is almost always going to take the brunt of any performance changes. So like if you're for some reason your overall performance is down, that top ad, that top ad set is going to have the worst appearing performance because it's the one getting the most spend. So doing taking a, an action like turning that ad off is really not advisable. It's really an aggressive move to make nine times out of 10. Uh, and I wouldn't really recommend it. Thinking about the whole account is, uh, it is a great point because I, I often think that it's, it's not your job as a media buyer or a marketer to, to improve the, like it's not your job to get all of our ads under like X CPA. Right. Not like, every, yeah, every single object doesn't. It's about the overall performance. But it's really hard to do that. And to when that's your job to get everything lower, it's really hard to see something that has higher cost yeah. and think that that is okay. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to like leave that in there. Um, 
But if you're, you know, if you just keep turning off stuff or changing stuff and manually inputting, mm -hmm. you're basically just playing whack-a-mole mm -hmm. and you're not helping improve or scale something. You're mm -hmm. better off just like nine times out of 10, you're better off with just letting it be mm -hmm. and letting it do its, letting the system do its thing. Even if sometimes it might take some, a couple days for it to, it might give you, it might get it wrong and it might readjust, but you should be paying attention to the, the top spending ad. And if that changes over time and pay attention to the metrics, May look at the CPCs, look at the hook rates to understand, try and understand why is the system optimizing to these? Why are users engaging with these ads? It's both empathy for the users who are taking these actions and empathy for the system and why the system would be making these decisions for on your behalf. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. The thumbnail is an extension of your hook. It's the first piece of your ad that users subconsciously judge. Take some swings with your thumbnails. Yep, that's it. There's nothing. There's nothing more I need to say about that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. What should I mean? I feel like thumbnail testing is something that people sometimes mention, but yeah. very few people actually do. I don't test that much. Um, but what I'll often do is like if something failed, you know, I'll look at you know, may, I might notice it in the hook. Um, or if it's something that I think made, should have worked better, or I'll look at just the, the, I'll just look at the thumbnail and think, how would this resonate with my audience? If the ad failed, I'll look at it. All right. Maybe I'll just throw a different hook on this. Throw, sorry, excuse me, throw a different thumbnail on this and just make something that could be either more obfuscated, less, less, you know, less clear, mm -hmm. um, or throw something on more clear and more specific about something else. Because... That thumbnail is the first little nuggets that it's, you know, before the video even plays. Um, if it's, a, you know, like it's before the video even plays. So it's that first little taste that your brain, that a viewer's brain is getting uh, on a Facebook ad that about a third of the ad will scroll into frame if you're in feed um, before the, the video auto plays. And that's where your brain is like making subconscious decisions about if it's going to, what, what that ad is going to be and if it's relevant and if your brain is going to pay attention to it or not. Uh, and if it is an ad or not, like your brain is trying to calculate that because your brain has subconscious ad blockers. So like you want to, you know, be thoughtful about like, does that thumbnail immediately tell someone to skip? And if so, how do we change that? So there are other people that say like they test, you know, different thumbnails, like, th you know, two, three thumbnails with every ad. Mm -hmm. I don't, we don't do that. Yeah. Um, but we do test it sometimes. Um, but generally like I look at it, like does the hook have a good thumbnail visual in it. And that can be, you know, the one-to-one -one, that can be, that can be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can also have, by the way, a thumbnail that has no relation to the immediate hook. And it could be something that like people will see in the thumbnail and be like, whoa, wait, what was that? And then they'll watch the video hoping to catch it, the rest of it, whatever was in that thumbnail later. Yeah. Would your recommendation be to people? Because I've seen like some people just go automatic. Some people go manual first frame. Some people upload their own custom thumbnails. Yeah. What's the recommendation on like gen like generally on on all new ads that are being tested? And yeah. then like you said that we we do some stuff where we, we test on specific yeah. ads after we've already tested them. I mean, I recommend and media buyers always choosing a thumbnail, usually just the first one. Like just by default. Manual thumbnail, the first option available in Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. Um I th I think there's a lot of like if you've worked too hard on making crafting a crafting, if you're crafting a thumbnail, you're probably working too hard. And and there's a lot of bias that goes into that. So like, it's not about making the prettiest, best, most relevant uh, thumbnail, but you know, there's some ugliness to thumbnails that can work well. And that's, that's what I try and often do is like make it relevant, but make it kind of ambiguous or kind of, I don't know. I, I want to obfuscate or, not make it clear that I just want to make it clear. It's not an ad. That's what I'm trying to do in a thumbnail, not trying to make it like the most perfect thumbnail. A 75% hook rate is useless. If it has nothing to do with what you're selling, yeah. simply getting attention isn't enough. Yep. You need relevant attention. Yep. Focus on improving hook relevance, not yeah. just hook rate. Like I said, I love my tweets. Um, yeah, that one is, uh, it's, you know, we've, we've been talking about that a lot. Like, it's again, it doesn't matter if you can get the most hook rate. If it's not relevant, it, do, it doesn't sell. It doesn't matter. That's it. Like it, it 75% hook rate is really impressive. I've made ads with 75% hook rates and it is wild, but 
it doesn't mean that it's going to outperform, you know, something with a 20% hook rate. If that 20% hook rate is the right 20% of people that saw that ad and paid attention and kept going, it's way better than the wrong 75% of people. Yeah, because here's the thing. When people compare hook rates, they always, like, they assume that all other th variables are equal. Yeah, like just more attention is better. It's not yeah. the case. Because when, when, you're, when you're thinking about hook rate, like, okay, 75% of people uh, are watching, but like that who what you do and say in your in your hook like greatly impacts the audience to which will resonate with that ad and greatly mm -hmm. impacts the audience that will bring into your funnel off the back of that yeah so i mean i've said the, the example on, on the channel like quite a few times but like i, I could stand there in a bikini if i'm saying yes, i don't think same, me too I mean, I mean, we could both do it yeah um it would get a lot it would definitely get a high high hook rate i think it would i don't know how many bikinis it would sell good point right that's a good point but it definitely, uh, I mean, if you were selling bikinis with us in the bikini, at least there would be a bikini ad. But if it was us in bikinis trying to sell gummy worms, like, that's a stretch. If it's us in bikinis trying to sell bidets, like, that's a big stretch. Yeah. So, like, again, it'll get tons of attention. But, like, we have, to, it's a real stretch for that attention to get to be relevant to that product. Now, it's it's interesting because we've had, like, examples of ad create where we've literally had, like, ads that have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on, like, 13 14 percent hook yeah. rates um and like i'm there's always like a, a bit of a dichotomy between uh you know the 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 understanding of like your ad needs to qualify your potential buyers and disqualify everyone else yeah. versus can we do something that's super broad yeah and will get a lot of attention yeah and there will be a downstream effect of some of our audience will be in that pool and there is yeah. no real right or wrong answer no to there, that. there isn't it's it's so hard to like yeah, it's, it's you know, you can make a perfectly target, like, perfect ad that's just like, all right, gets the right attention. Those people stick around. Those people keep going. They click. Then they buy because, like, you just nailed it, right? But And that's great. But that might not be that scalable. And our goal often is to make something that's more scalable. So we need to make stuff that, like, is more broadly relatable than, that has to, like, still do that for a lot of people. So, like, you know, you're just making something that's, super targeted, super relevant, isn't really scalable. So we got to find a balance. And having that super accurate hook rate, like super dialed in, whatever, or like bigger or whatever, it, it's all just so variable and dependent on the rest of the ad and what the rest of it does and who those people were in the first place and what stage in the life cycle they're in and blah, blah, blah. There's just so many, too many variables to put to the, the, that much weight on hook rate. So there, Yeah, there is no right or wrong, but it's just like be aware. Like be aware when you're comparing two ads, yeah. and it's like I mean, even to an extent, like if, if it's it's the same concept, but just but just different variations of the hook. Yeah. Like just bear in mind there are so many factors that yeah. impact uh, if someone continues watching or not. It doesn't mean necessarily that a high hook rate is better or a low hook rate is worse. Yeah. Yes, you will create ads that have high hook rates that do really well, and you'll probably create ads with low hook rates that don't do very mm -hmm. well. But it's not necessarily an indicator of success. The hook rates are a good diagnostic. And a diagnostic from which you can then take and make qualitative analysis and assumptions from. Mm -hmm. That's where it's valuable. That's where hook rates are super valuable to me is I'm trying to think through the gap between hook rate and the click and the sale, like what's going on there mm -hmm. so that I can qualitatively go back to that video and try and figure out what did we, what can we do here? Where can we <laughs> speed things up? Where can we add? Where can we subtract yeah. to make a better ad? Yeah, retention charts can come in, in handy for those as well. Absolutely. Hook rates, hold rates, retention charts. Yeah. All good uh, when you're actually working out like, okay, this is an ad that's worth us going to work on. Right. How are we going to troubleshoot this? Yeah. To conclude, anyone can make an ad. Mm. I don't care if you're the CEO yeah. or an intern. Yeah. Shoot on your phone, yep. edit in CapCut, no more excuses, just make ads. Yeah, I mean... I almost wish I said, don't even worry about editing it. Like, make the longest ad that you can that doesn't require any edits. If that's six seconds, okay. If that's 15 seconds, great. If that's 30, cool. If that's three minutes, amazing, right? Like, just shoot something. Anyone can do it. Um, you can find inspo in organic content, find inspo in other ads from other brands. Mm -hmm. Just make something, and that will... You know, A, probably make you one of the best ads in your account just by fundamentally knowing about the product well and being able to speak authentically and with authority about it, especially for founders. Um, and it'll just often work. And then it, even if it doesn't work, that failure is good. That's good for you. Learn You learn from it. 
And even if you don't ever put that ad live, at least, you know, going through that, that motion creatively is such an incredible way to start to get ideas and brainstorm and like think of things you hadn't already thought of uh, about that product and about how to market it and about how to try and make it relatable to the audience in a way that, that they'll care about. So just, just do it. Just fucking go make something. It's just stop. It's so infuriating to me how many people don't make their own ads and refuse to even try because I don't even know because they're camera shy or whatever. You don't have to be in the ad. You don't. Shoot it. Uh, shoot it this way. I mean, yeah, we saw like right we saw the uh, the anchor ad. I'll put the anchor ad on, on the screen now. Like that made literally on TikTok shop made the creator three hundred k. Oh yeah, uh, made the made the brand seven figures. Yeah. Uh, literally just a stupid ad of a like over the top of the of yeah. the charger saying about why it's a good charger. Yeah. Crushed it. Yep. And you know it's just about like you know like I wouldn't expect anyone to be able to just go and do that like that required like this the story the arc you know to get that right the hook it it takes practice and whatever but like a lot of times just getting something raw real and believable and authentic like is going to be better than than the the crap ad that your brand wants to put out anyway. So like, just go make something. That's it. Just go make something. Try, fail. And if you're in this business, if you're watching this video, like, get comfortable with failure. If you're not already comfortable with failure, I don't know how you're in this business. This is a game of failure. Ninety nine percent of stuff we do probably sucks and fails, and we're all fine with it. And bro, by the way, our team internally is fantastic at dealing with failure, and that we have a great culture that is comfortable with failure. We're comfortable with people having bad ideas. That's what makes us really good is I don't – if someone comes to us with a bad idea, I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, it's a bad idea. But, like, I'm happy that they came to me with a bad idea. I'm happy that they said it. I'm happy that we have an environment where people can bring forward bad ideas, and we don't treat them like they're bad ideas. But it's fine if it's a bad idea. Like – because you're only going to get to good ideas through having lots of bad ideas and trying lots of things and failing lots of things. Yeah, there's no ego. So everyone throws ideas yeah. into the hat. Yeah. And then we just, as a team, we pick out the best ones. We don't even pick out the We try, we also try stuff that isn't the best. Well, yeah, that's also <laughs> true. That's also true. You have to test against your own hypotheses and your own uh, your own biases. Yeah, that's a tweet that nearly made it in. Yeah. But I didn't do that one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Barry, thank you very much. Sal. Alex, a pleasure. Tell the people where they can find you. Where, whatever. I don't know. Find me on the internet. Find me, uh, you heard that. Uh, Barry Hot. Google me. Find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Find my newsletter, which is great for people who don't like newsletters because I don't publish it much. Um, and uh, yeah, you can book me on intro.co or Mentor Pass or my own site. Uh, you can, you can uh, if you need some consulting, need me, need me to help you uh, make some better ads or fix up your media buying. Happy to do it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, sir. Pleasure to have you on. Uh, if you enjoyed uh, this video with Barry, uh, like and subscribe. Got a lot more content coming this year on AI and advertising. So thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one. And share this. Share this with someone. Share it as well. Share it in Slack. Share it, share it with your friends. Yeah, share, share it everywhere. LinkedIn. Share it on MySpace. No, that's a bad deal. Do joke. whatever you want. Share, share it with your family them. members too. Because yeah. uh, they need to see this. Yeah. Really Please. need to see this. <laughs> your family, yeah. Thanks for watching. <laughs>